Hello, and welcome to The Excerpt. I'm Taylor Wilson. Could the woolly mammoth return? Ben Lamb thinks so. He's the co-founder of Colossal Biosciences, a company at the heart of an evolving science that aims to bring the ancient animal back to life. Here to talk about his work and the ongoing ethical debate around the extinction is Ben Lamb, co-founder and CEO of Colossal. Ben, thanks for coming on The Excerpt today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. So, Ben, it sounds like something straight out of science fiction. I'm sure you've gotten that before. Bringing back the woolly mammoth. Can you just set the stage for us here? Why the woolly mammoth and why now? For us, you know, we think that de-extinction and species preservation go hand in hand. And we are at this, you know, interesting inflection point for biodiversity, where when we started the business, a lot of the, da- a lot of the data that we saw was that we were going to lose up to 10% of biodiversity between now and 2050. Fast forward three years later, those new numbers are now 35 to 50% loss of biodiversity between now and 2050. And so I think that now more than ever, we need to build technologies to uh, save critically endangered species, as well as build a de-extinction toolkit that we can leverage uh, uh, to bring back lost keystone species um, should we need to. And, and hopefully we won't need to, um, but uh, the current uh, trajectory doesn't look as positive as you know uh, one would hope. You mentioned biodiversity, Ben. What's the benefit of bringing this animal back functionally? I've read about restoring Arctic tundra ecosystems, for instance. Uh, what are the, the tangible functional benefits here? I think you've got kind of like two core functions when, it, when we talk about bringing back specifically the mammoth. One is uh, there's a, a huge movement to looking at reintroducing species back into their natural environment, uh, a, a process called rewilding, which you know we're working with partners around the world on. Specifically with the mammoth, we have this massively degraded ecosystem in the Arctic that is full of carbon, full of methane, um, but it doesn't have the best uh, biodiversity uh, turnover there because you just don't have what the, the, the cold tolerant species used to have there. So what's interesting is that a lot of scientists around the world have been doing different types of ecological studies and impact studies for reintroducing cold tolerant megafauna back into the environment. And then on, you know, the far side of the argument, you've got other scientists that say, hey, you know, you may not have that level of impact, but generally speaking, a more diverse ecosystem and kind of like what we see in Africa with forest elephants and savanna uh, elephants, there is a massive impact to the carbon nitrogen cycle, which also helps uh, add to uh, and improve that degraded ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. Excited to take a look at that, Ben. So uh, the woolly mammoth went extinct around 4,000 years ago. Um, A video on the UK's Natural History Museum website posits that climate change was probably the cause of the mammoth's extinction. But if anything, the climate is now getting warmer, not colder. How do you bring back the grasses, Ben, that they primarily fed on and where? You know, people think of mammoths as uh, when when they start to think of the mammoth, they're like, oh, this is a species that, uh, you know, sometimes people uh, put it into the category of like, you know, 65 million years ago. But to your point, they actually went extinct only, you know, people were building the pyramids while mammoths still existed, you know, on the earth. And what what people also don't realize is during these interglacial interglacial periods, there was actually uh, times were which were as warm and a little bit warmer than today. And then there were also subspecies like Colombian mammoths and, and, and others. And so many of them were actually found in pretty warm and temperate climates. And so not only could they not survive today, uh, but we do believe that they could thrive today with the existing ecosystem that exists uh, today compared to uh, what, what was uh, around um, in, in some of the cycles that have been present, uh, even in the last 80,000 years, we don't even have to go back 2.6 million years ago. Um, and then what we've seen in Arctic rewilding and generally in, in rewilding is that when you reintroduce a cold tolerant uh, or even a non cold tolerant uh, uh, herbivore in keystone species like in Africa or what we've seen in Yellowstones with uh, some of the uh, predators like the wolves, as well as what's been modeled with uh, the mammoths, is that you actually have a flourishing of of fauna and and plant fauna, uh, including grasslands, shrubs, and and, and, and other species, because a lot of these large herbivores are massive grazers, defecators, and they they enrich that that carbon, carbon nitrogen cycling. So we've talked about the positives, the benefits here, Ben. What are the, the potential, the possible negatives or drawbacks to these projects? I think the biggest thing that you have that that could be a, a negative drawback is education. I think that that it's on our responsibility 
to ensure that everything that we're doing is transparent, everything that we're doing is et ethical. I think that you know it's our job to really educate the public and have you know interesting dialogues like this, uh, and not um, and not be you know uh, closed off and 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 whatnot. We're pretty open minded. Some of our biggest critics are now advisors or even full time at the company. We just brought on Beth Shapiro, um, who, uh, you know, early in the early days of the company was not our biggest fan. And we actually engage with those critics and get, and get, and get feedback from them and, 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 and allow them to help shape kind of our mission and vision. Because, you know, we believe this is not an American project, uh, you know, or a Texan project or an Alaskan project. We really do view this as an international project in, in terms of what the impact is across species and for conservation. And so for us, um, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, really being uh, thoughtful about listening to uh, critical feedback, being really thoughtful about the intended and unintended consequences around rewilding, I think is really, really important. And in making sure that all of the technologies that we develop on this path to de-extinction are directly applied to conservation in short order and make sure that we continue to bring new money to, to, to conservation. Ben, we've talked a lot of big picture here. Can you just get into the science a bit for our listeners? How does all this work and what are some of the latest developments here? Fundamentally, what you have to do to, to, to bring back a, 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 an extinct species is, and the way that we think about that is you're not making a clone of that, that extinct species. So there's a lot of computational analysis that goes into this. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, select gene targeting, and then there's also enhancement. So we think of de-extinction as really kind of rebuilding extinct species for thriving today. And that's a combination of de-extincting those core genes. And we get those core genes by assembling a lot of ancient DNA because DNA quickly degrades and is fragmented over time. Um, but then uh, at the same time, uh, we also have an opportunity from a, uh, uh, a computational analysis perspective that we will take uh, the genes uh, uh, from the existing living species and do comparative analysis using AI so that we truly understand you know, uh, what genes made a mammoth a mammoth. And then once you do that, you can start to establish um, different uh, cell lines uh, from, these, from these species that exist today, like the Asian elephant, which is 99.6% uh, same genetically uh, as the mammoth. Um, and then we can engineer in those lost genes and de-extinct those lost genes into uh, Asian elephant cell lines. And then I'm oversimplifying it, but then we go through a process, but there's a lot of testing and functional and molecular assays along the way. Uh, but then we go through a process called somatic cell nuclear transfer that Dolly made uh, probably most famous um, uh, over the years. And, uh, and then in that, uh, we then take that, that embryo after we've done that somatic cell nuclear transfer of the, uh, of the nucleus, and we insert it into that of, of, of a surrogate host, in this case, uh, the Asian elephant. And then hopefully 22 months later, you know, we get our, our first uh, mammoth calves. And so that's kind of the high level um, view of, of, of the process. And so um, this is, uh, it's, it's very paralleled to our work on saving the Northern white rhino that we're working on with with Thomas Hildebrandt in Kenya. Um, it's a very, very similar process, but this uh, was a big achievement uh, for our teams that have been working on it for uh, the last three years. You mentioned the Northern white rhino. Um, what are some of the other species you're currently working on? We've announced the mammoth. We've, we've announced the Tasmanian tiger or the thylacine that went extinct in uh, 1936 in Australia. Uh, and we've announced the dodo, which went extinct in, in the 1600s in, in, in Mauritius. And it's kind of the symbol of of, of, de, uh, of extinction, right, of, of, of human-caused extinction. And most people really just want to talk to us about, they're like, what's the next extinct animal? It's like, we are working on that. Shouldn't that be enough? We're, we're working on, I feel like we're working on quite a bit. These projects are very hard. You know, we have 200 plus people that are working on these projects worldwide. But I like to, I love the question that you asked because I like to talk about the, there's actually more critically endangered species that we're working on. Uh, and so we're doing a lot of work right now uh, in, in Africa uh, using AI and drones, not even genetics, to understand populate uh, to understand a little bit of population genomics in, 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 from genetics, but mostly herd dynamics. Working with orf elephant orphanages to figure out how do we best rewild elephants back uh, that have been separated from a herd that are orphaned back into herd. Understanding migra uh, uh, corridors and migratory patterns uh, in Kenya uh, with AI and drones. Very exciting stuff. So you know, I'm curious. We've talked a lot about colossal. Um, are there other companies working on this too, doing similar work? And do you see this as a collaborative effort among scientists all over the world? Science for, uh, you know, I think generally should be 
um, collaborative. Sometimes it gets competitive. You know, I don't come from the field, right? So, um, uh, uh, but but generally it gets uh, it, it 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 should be uh, collaborative. And most researchers uh, around the world do want to collaborate. Um, we've been very fortunate. You know, we work with you know Rewild. We work with. Um, uh, save the elephants. Uh, we work with the Species Survival Commission, which is a sub uh, part of the uh, IUCN. We work with the Asian uh, um, Elephant Specialist Group, Conservation Nation, Wild Ark, um, the Vertebrate Vertebrate Genome Project. Who I love. Their goal is to genetic is to back up. Uh, you know, uh, do sequencing for all vertebrates on the planet. The think of it as like the effective seed vault only for animals. And so, how do we sequence these animals and take those genetic codes? And store them uh, on servers and protect uh, life so that you know. Uh, so hopefully we don't lose it. And so we work with um, uh, governments and, and partners all around the world. Um, you know, I think that uh, we are probably the most cutting edge when it looks at when you're looking at uh, cutting edge uh, conservation related technologies. So I mentioned science fiction at the top. We've all seen Jurassic Park. I'm sure you're maybe tired of these people. I, I, I'm surprised there's a Jurassic Park question. We've never heard that. So <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that is a new one for you, sir. Where do you land on the ethics of all of this, of de-extinction and some of the conversations we're having? Yeah. I mean, obviously we think it's unethical not to do this, right? Like we are eradicating species as as humans at an alarming rate we're changing our climate at an alarming rate we are uh de we are cutting down forest and doing deforestation we are polluting our planet with plastics uh at, at, at an alarming rate and so we need new uh opportunities for this and i think synthetic biology does that and you know to the jurassic uh part uh, address part question, which we have, we do get variants of that from, can we make dinosaurs to, you know, all these types of different questions that we get, um, uh, over the years. Um, you know, what I think people still have to remember is that while Jurassic Park was a dystopian movie, very entertaining, did quite well at the box office. And I enjoyed it as obviously millions of others did worldwide. Uh, but what we're really doing is the extinction for the purpose of species preservation. I don't think that they had the same goals in mind at Jurassic Park as, as, as ours. Um, um, but I do think that one of the benefits that did come from the film, from the film is the art of the possible in, in inspiring people and educating people on the power of genetic engineering. You know, there are some pretty heady claims about what Colossal will do on your website, including save us, our planet and the species that inhabit it. I'm curious about that and how so. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I think that it, it's better to have a de-extinction toolkit and not need it than not have a de-extinction toolkit and absolutely need it. And these keystone species that exist are critical to our way of life. When you remove keystone predators and herbivores from their environments, you start to have a cascading effect where you have downgrading occur and it has you have loss of other biodiversity, you have loss of plant fauna, you have lot you have entire rivers and streams that actually change the shape as we've seen in Yellowstone. And so if we, I don't think Colossal is a silver bullet for saving biodiversity, but I do think that we are one of hopefully, we're one thread of hopefully a tapestry of, of, of collaborators and technologies uh, around the world that can be leveraged for conservation. And, and I think that we have to act now. You know, I think that people warned us for quite some time about the impending impacts of, of human caused climate change. And I think a lot of people didn't listen. Now people are starting to listen. Biodiversity is a uh, is an existential threat uh, to our way of life here on the planet, and so I hope that there's a thousand colossals out there uh, building tools and technologies for uh, conservation and saving species. All right, Ben Lamb is co-founder and CEO of Colossal Biosciences. Fascinating work and a great conversation. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Thanks for watching. I'm Taylor Wilson. I'll see you next time.